Of all the staff ever employed at Seoby Hall, only the gardeners have been constant. And it is possible to trace an unbroken succession of gardeners, from John Chafer, who came to the hall in 1811, to those employed today. It is an interesting fact that with the exception of the dovecot in the zoo, the gardener's bothy is the only building on the estate still used for the purpose for which it was originally built. The history of the gardeners is a living history, not only embodied in the physical presence of the modern-day gardener, but also in the plants, trees and layouts of the gardens as we see them today. But there is also an architectural history of their presence, as well as a memorialised one, and at least three of the hall's gardeners lie buried in the Seoby churchyard. In the 19th century, the gardener was classed amongst the most senior of servants, and some could rise to great heights in both wealth and status. Joseph Paxton, head gardener at Chatsworth in 1826, is an example. Paxton's interest in greenhouses led him to develop the use of prefabricated cast iron frames, and ultimately to design the Crystal Palace for the Great Exhibition of 1851. On a much smaller scale, his ideas influenced the use of cast iron in the orangery at Seoby. By the time of his death, Paxton had been knighted, served as a Member of Parliament, was a director of a railway company, a much sought-after landscape gardener, and a very wealthy man. Of course, many gardeners did not have such glittering careers, but there is evidence to show the importance and status held by the head gardener at Seoby Hall. When the estate was walled in the mid-19th century, three lodges were built on the estate. The one for the gardener was by far the largest. In addition, the gardener's accounts, which survived for the years 1857 to 62, show that George Brodie, head gardener from 1852 to 57, was paid £45 per annum. His successor in the post, Thomas Ashby, head gardener from 1857 to 66, whose appointment coincided with a marked increase in the family's garden expenditure, received substantially more with a salary of £60 a year. To put these sums into context, the upper salary limit that Mrs Beaton recommended for a butler in the 1870s was £50. Sadly, we have no records of the salary paid to Robert Anderson, head gardener from 1866 to 1921, who was responsible for the design and layout of the pleasure garden and the planting of the monkey puzzle trees. The account books also show that in 1857, five junior gardeners were employed, with salaries ranging from about £14 to £40 a year. This number of gardeners seems to have remained a constant, despite the increasing mechanisation of gardening in the 19th and 20th centuries. The family spent £6.11 shillings on a lawn mowing machine in 1859, perhaps one of the new chain-driven machines patented by Thomas Green that same year. In 1911, the census records four gardeners lodging at the house of George Abbott, himself a gardener, in Seerby Main Street. For a family like the Grahams, the garden and estate around their house was a statement, a means of presenting to their visitors the wealth, quality and status of the owners, without any need to even enter the house. This was something that owners of country houses like the Grahams were willing to invest considerable sums of money to achieve, and for which a good head gardener was worth his weight in gold.